Well, this has been a rather uplifting day, hasn't it? I always love a good day of positive thinking. But I'm going to be honest with you. When first given the topic of this conference, I thought to myself, utopia? Really? Haven't we been down this path before? Marx, Lenin, O Brave New World. What could I offer as a model of utopia? I'm just John, a guy who likes to think positively and hopes at some point to make meaningful influence on people's lives. But what could I come up with that Marx and Lenin didn't? So I'm going to be honest with you. I have no model of utopia for you. And in fact, I think the idea of utopia is the problem. What I'm going to do instead of telling you a story of utopia is tell you a story about the universe, biology, and behavior, and use that story to give us some insight into the utopic moments in the real world, not some artificial ones. And now what you might ask yourself, what story could be universal enough to transcend the time and space of the entire universe, biology, and behavior? And my story is one of love. Now, you may want to think of love as something that can't be science, something that can't be distilled into facts and equations, a more personal feeling. But I hope by the end of this story, you'll come to see the power of the human concept of love as one that transcends all of the spatial organization and time and space. So let's get to it. This story begins, like the universe, with a big bang. Perhaps you're already seeing some connections. <laughs> I have depicted here in this illustration two highly explosive moments, releasing tremendous amounts of energy, maybe more for the original Big Bang, but that may depend on your style. <clears throat> in the couple that we see here, we see a sort of dance around each other, a resonance of back and forth emotions. Love in relationships is goes, love is patient, love is kind. Love is about being there for support in good times and bad. But love is also about maintaining your independence. If it's going to be some, a love of um, indefinite duration, you have to be independent and provide something to the relationship so that you form something new and emergent together, more than the sum of your parts. So really, love is complex and it's hard to understand, if we even understand it. And th this view of love is one that I think really is a way of t looking at the universe as well. You see, at the beginning of the universe, according to the Big Bang Theory, there was really only energy and no matter. One of the modern questions of physics still today is where does matter come from? I like to think of it this way. Imagine packets of energy floating around in a sort of early universe soup. At times, these en packets of energy may have bumped into each other, coming so close too fast, as you sure may, may have had in some relationships, that you spark off in other directions. I'm out of that thing. That was just, that, that didn't work. <laughs> at other times, they rolled, they hit each other at the right angle to roll around in a sort of seductive dance, spending a moment together before heading off in their separate directions. And then there are those moments when they hit each other with the right momentum, with the right trajectory, the time and space, to spend, to dance with one another, to resonate with one another, and become, form a bond that's almost inseparable. This is the moment when matter was born out of a loving partnership of energy a moment from which our stars and galaxies were born. And interestingly, even this relationship can be broken, as we showed when we broke matter into energy with the atomic bomb. Now, what I'd like to do is take this universal story a little closer to home, and to Earth. The early Earth, like the early universe, was a violent soup of reactions. The molecules of Earth, participate in a variety of activities, some bumping into each other, breaking others apart, some self-replicating, living in the conditions appropriate for replicating. But as the Earth cooled, 
those conditions changed. And self-replication became more difficult, and, this, it, and something new was needed. And a few molecules found themselves in the right place at the right time to form another dance, clustering into cells with the internal conditions appropriate for continued survival of the molecules, the partners, and the relationship. Now, since the origin of life has evolved and, and diversified into the many forms that we see today, and it's done so by forming new relationships along the way. Some of these relationships were mutually beneficial, mutualisms, where both partners in the relationship directly benefited from one another. In some cases, these relationships became so intrinsically interconnected with one another that they shared their entire information libraries, their genes, forming the first higher complexity organisms where the original partners became the tissues and organ systems of the higher complexity organisms. And then there were the moments. There were other types of relationships where they weren't necessarily mutually beneficial or directly beneficial, like a predator and prey. Now, you might ask yourself, how could a predator and prey be viewed positively as consuming it? To answer that, don't look at the level of the individuals, but the level of the community. For example, rabbits need foxes, because without foxes to consume rabbits, the rabbits would replicate or reproduce indefinitely and run out of grass or, and be swimming in their own grass or feces. So even in a predator-prey uh, relationship, there's a tension dance, a loving partnership around the oscillations, and you see it in the ecology of them. But it's not just with predator and prey that there's a tension. Even in the organ systems of the human body, there's imperfection to the relationship. For example, when an, an, a foreign invader is detected, the immune system sometimes makes a mistake and attacks human tissue. Just as, and, and you know, I would say when you attack your your partner, they don't, they're not exactly happy with it either. So I tell this story about the evolution of the universe and the evolution of life to give us a context for all the amazing relationships, the loving partnerships that have built the cradle of our existence. And they build it by building layers and layers and layers of complexity that I like to call levels of vertical enumeration, L-O-V-E. Now, I tell this story to give us a sense of place. But what I'd like to do now is also to talk about an active process, behavior. Now, in natural systems, altruism, or the act of doing something beneficial to another individual, is seen all over. And in humans, we do this all the time, and we think about it as a cognitive process. I make the choice to engage in an altruistic behavior, but it's not necessarily cognitive. So to avoid the complexities of human cognition, because who knows what even I am thinking, let alone you, let's look at altruism in slime molds. I know you're probably thinking, because I heard it, slime molds? Are slime, how could slime molds be altruistic? Well, they do share resources for reproduction, but they only do so under certain circumstances. Let's take a look. In this diagram here, I have depicted three variables, territories, altruism, and mobility. Now, they, <clears throat> why would slime molds be have formed territories? Well, think to yourself, are you not more likely to protect something when you know the people around you that you can trust these people. If someone comes around, you're like, I don't know, I don't know if I could trust you. Altruism, the same idea. When you spend more time with someone, you're more likely to engage in positive behaviors to, to help others around you. Sure, you may engage in activities like, you know, I'm gonna help this passing stranger by giving them a dollar, 
but you're more likely to do something good for someone that you spend a lot of time with, right? So it's easy to see the connection between altruism and territories, and that you know, slime molds do this. They share resources to reproduce, and they actually sacrifice their lives for other members of their colony. Now, the, qu the interesting part is the third piece of this system, the mobility, or the ability to switch between groups. We might think about it in a sense of when um, a highly uh, uh, an individual approaches a highly territorial environment uh, the, the, uh, or, or, or colony, they go a little um, mafia style on them, sending some chemical weapons at them and say, absolutely not, you're not allowed here. We've been together too long, we don't trust someone else. But the more often there are mobile slime molds, the less likely they are to form highly integral territories. So that's good. Less war, right? The more mobility, the more the less war. What's the difference, though? Less territoriality, less altruism. So there's a hazy, optimal level of mobility at which the slime molds aren't weary of a foreign passer but they spend enough time together to engage in altruistic behaviors. Now, in many ways, humans are no different from slime molds, besides sometimes men being associated with slime. <laughs> we, too, are affected by mobility. In the United States and around the world, we focus on the idea that we must offer an ever-increasing level of mobility. We've built interstate highway systems, cell phone networks, the inter internet, et cetera, to offer this ever-increasing level of mobility. And it's come with the great capacity to interact with many different people and transform entire landscapes with human development. But it's also come with a, a, another side, fewer times spent with select individuals and fewer native landscapes. Just as in slime molds, is there a case of too much mobility in humans? We tend to pursue more and more, thinking unidirectionally. We do this for wealth, energy, love. How do we get more and more? The problem when we do this is that we put blinders on and focus on a few ideas. We ignore the diversity around us and become blinded by the intention of working harder and harder on the same thing while getting less and less return. Today, we're in the cradle of a loving universe, built up relationship by relationship, each being the foundation for the new level of complexity. But we also face a problem, a situation of unraveling these relationships. High divorce rates, atomic weapons, extreme inequity in communities, and an ever-accelerating rate of biodiversity loss and loss of native ecosystems. We lose these things not intentionally, but for a simple reason. We crave unidirectional improvement and use linear and ideological thinking to get there. We forget that love is about a dance, a push and a pull, and that the universe itself seems organized by love. To the extent that we hide from the universe and pretend to be independent and ignore the physical limitations and restrictions placed upon us by it, we starve ourselves from a love billions of years in the making. We deconstruct the very cradle that built us. While we've learned so much from our science and social progress, it's still only patterns and pieces, bits of reality. If we are to understand and pursue a future characterized by adaptability, mutual synergy, and peace, we must continue to always look deep within ourselves on the limitations of our understanding of love in this complex yet beautiful universe, and always be humbled by the fact that to this day, I know of no one who can tell me why he or she loves.